The Rebuke by Michael Shea. 1. Hackle the Smaller, by the spring of his fifty first year, saw his death almost every day. It was a death by disease, and, like most of this class, was a communicative sort that liked to get acquainted with its clients. The two of them would sit at dusk on Hackle's crumbling porch, talking quietly or pausing in their talk, their eyes musing on the hilly city of Harab just across the Tumble River. Hackle viewed that city of Harab with stoic bitterness, which flared into invective whenever he had a coughing fit. First, of course, whenever he coughed, he shot a questioning look at his death, which had always quietly shaken its head, so far at least. Then, when Hackle had finished the deep sick labor and sped out the clot of infection, he would shake his fist toward Harab and growl, his voice low to spare his lungs. <coughs> Smite and smash you, Harab, oh, whore among cities, oh, that the blow might fall on you. His death understood the reference, which was to a fantasy of Hackles. The prosperous main body of Harab, a clutch of marble-studded knolls, was overloomed by a crag. A tall, ragged eruption of naked rock from the riverside hills. In the Cross River slums, where Hackle now resided, there was an old saying about this crag. If the prayers of the poor could push stone, the jut would have fallen on Nabob Hill a hundred years ago. Hackle's wish would go this proverb one better. He had been, before the decay of his fortunes, a statutarius, master grade, and one of his fortes and special loves had always been hands. Bodge, of the central statutarium, had been wont to say, when they sat with their colleagues in the refractory, Now Hackle here, God bless him, friends! Hackle here cuts fingers as articulate, as eloquent as tongues. Hackle's hands speak, and they speak not prose, but balanced stanzas. Have we not seen him convey whole epics with the faintest crooking of a left thumb? So that now, on half pension, and dying from the toxic rock dust of the quarries, too poor to inhabit the city, where once his profession had been dined and eulogized at the tables of the great. Now in his ruin, Hackle impotently longed to do a master work, a stupendous clenched fist of stone poised to annihilate the city under it. Sometimes, Hackle would start running on about this project, which always distressed his death, averting its small, starved face, usually so sympathetic, it would tactfully encourage him to resignation. Ah, well, my dear Hackle, but then, as you know, many of my colleagues have clients here. Retired statuary. No suffering is unique, after all. But in fact, Hackle was no longer really angry at his city. It was half in jest that he pictured his fist as literally falling, for its mere sculpting would suffice him. A colossal proclamation of his contempt for all that was venal, facile, and corrupt in the values of his wealthier countrymen. But how could he really hate something as diffuse 
as masterless as that circus of follies, the culture market. The public purse has always fed or starved the arts according to its whim. In truth, he had better cause for anger at his own guild. If sculpture in Harab, after its long supremacy, was now so displaced by other arts, so unattended, who but the statuarium itself was to blame? In its infallible lust for immediate profit, the guild had energetically recapitulated whatever sold well, and tirelessly boycotted, blocked, and otherwise muffled every one of those stylistic radicals who might have infused new life into its art. Need anyone wonder that music, hot cuisine, and even literature currently engrossed the well-to-do and their purses. Once, the guild had given steady birth to a marmorial populace which took up residence in the gardens and grottoes of the rich, the lamasseries and monikeries of the hills, the municipal prayer booths and public parks. Now, that market was glutted. Ships plied the tumble, laden with stony refugees, all bound for sale at discounts far away, where their history was unknown, and they were oddities. Oh yes, the statuarium could be said to have achieved what it had so blockheadedly worked for. Yet, even for the guild, Hackle felt little more than the remembrance of anger. It did still cause him a twinge to recall the zeal with which the guild directors had lobbied for city subsidies to open the Pelsite quarry. How greedily they'd embraced this boon of bright, abundant, easy-working stone. But then they had at least all shared the unlucky outcome of its use, the tainted lungs and shortness of life. What else was to be expected, after all, of any human institution? All were heir to misfortune, self-damage, eventual entropy. Witness the guild's concluding fiasco, the investment of its long-term assets in western blood oysters, wherein said assets sank without a bubble. This left Hackle and his fellows hunched into cross-river slums, drawing stipends too small to buy more than one meal a day. What a perfect finishing touch, in a way. Guilds and their like are but men, after all, and men are fools. And so, late one afternoon, as they watched the sun wester behind hilly Harab, and his death was gently upbraiding him for some of his typical large talk, Hackle made a sudden gesture, as of surrender, and interrupted his companion. <coughs> Please, my friend, after all, <laughs> you know, it's really little more than a game of mine to carry on about the city or the statutarium. Uh, the fist, I'd like to carve it. <laughs> yes, one last great orgy of expression. My concluding judgment on men and their world, fairly thundered out, writ huge. But after all, everyone's world is a trap, a course of obstacles and pitfalls. The game has always been to outsmart your world, to excel, 
to accomplish good work in spite of it. Your colleagues must have told you how some of my retired co-workers rent and repine. Oh, but for this evil man or that stroke of bad luck, I'd be a wealthy and healthy success today. And that's childish, after all, isn't it? To cry foul and swear you've been cheated. Oh, far better to accept responsibility. <laughs> it's a state of mind that leaves you readier for action. His death sat hunched attentively, its elbows on its stark knobbed knees. In their shadowy, bruise-colored sockets, its eyes wore vague and meditative glints. It seemed, while politely engrossed, to be hearing some faint, contradictory undertone in Hackle's words. Absently, it screwed a fingertip into its tattered ear and dislodged a wiggling maggot, which, musingly, it flicked away. You speak now, my dear Hackle, like the excellent man I know you to be, though perhaps a readiness for action is not the most appropriate state of mind to cultivate in your present, um, circumstances. Still, your gameliness does you credit, as does your manly acceptance of responsibility. But, you know, strangely enough, in spite of your assurances, I feel that there is some great anger in you. Some vengeful fire. There is some deep matter wherein you do cast blame. Oh, yes, indeed. Nor is it anything <coughs> I make a secret of. Have I not spoken to you of <coughs> Huffcraft? Your guild sponsor? The same. <laughs> oh, guide and the governor of the first ten years of my education. Oh, brilliant, self-indulgent Hofcraft. How you betrayed me. Week in, week out. Through the long, irrevocable seasons of my first development. I think I have noted some grudge in you against this man. Yet your references to him are elliptical, oblique. <laughs> have I not said enough in saying that he... Educated me! Why, <laughs> after all, did I not rise above the guild? Why did I spend my life chained to it and to her up? Obviously, due to a failure of talent, not a lack of talent but failure to master it, to give it the force and focus to accomplish something lasting or other worlds ever lacking. Had my art been robust and confident enough to put at risk abroad, why not go free hammering in one of the south coast cities to hang out my shingle as Megas Lapodarius in some city of the Barbarian League where a theorist of style might try and get away with. 
anything. My friend, I see you embrace the very fallacy you just now denounced. You're crying foul and swearing you've been cheated. Hackle gave his forehead a firm shake. <coughs> I'm sorry, my friend. That is logically true, <coughs> no doubt. But this matter of education, it constitutes an exception, I believe. For in every life's budding phase, where is responsibility for its growth, if not with its teachers, with those who nurse its development? How, after all, can it nurse its own? The bitter thing is how able Hofcraft was to have done right by me. He had the talent and my devotion. Any youngster would have burned to be like that lean, crankish man who could make any solemn matter dance in the quick flame of his mockery. And, with one laconic flicker of his scorn, a mere phrase could reduce the most earnest pretension <coughs> to ash. His chisel was as articulate and as irresponsible as his tongue. There was the key to his cowardice. You see, he lived of what he scorned, and shamelessly carved in stone. For gold, every cliché or fatuity he had ever mocked. Yet, he would have bridled at the charge of hypocrisy. He believed his mockery absolved him of sin, for he was one of those satiric sorts whose prime concern was, by invalidating all around them, to remain free. <laughs> Such men are their own audience, but will also use a pupil for audience. Careless of his education, I learned his accuracy, his flexible invention, <laughs> his comic skill. But I also swallowed whole his facile misanthropy and nihilism, and with these, his primary rationalization for doing pointless work. Can any teacher be omnipotent? His death asked delicately. Surely the student's budding powers of judgment must be invoked at some point to assess his teacher's limits. But how? How could I have guessed the truth that this errant jack of all styles concealed from me? That great work is done only by those who risk seriousness who stake off a ground of truth and take a stand on it. Had I known these things in time, I might have imbibed the necessary ardor to forge my talent into something rare. I will tell you how I have come to understand, to visualize. Hofcraft's crime against me. The teacher must regard a student 
as a work in progress. Each stroke, each pressure on his mind must be deliberate, intended. The teacher's talent may be mediocre, but the mind he shapes will have learned at least of method, care, and purpose. <laughs> learned the gravity of art. But to heedless hedonistic Huffcraft, I was no work in progress. I was a practice stone, such cheap chalk stone as stands in apprentices' halls to study technique on, to chop out a quick study of some theme. He practiced his notions on me, whatever they might have been at a given time. There's his crime in essence, for which... I will never forgive the damned old mount back. And there, my friend, you have my history. What made me a jack of all styles myself. A patchy talent. Brilliant only in fits and starts. Fit, in short to spend my career and my life in the guild. <laughs> After a brief silence, Hackle's death shivered. Getting cold, it muttered, leaning forward and plugging one rag at the nose hole with a black-nailed thumb. It blew a maggot from the other hole and crushed it carefully under the ball of its stark tendoned foot. I do hate to hear clients reminisce like this. The death breathed sadly. Rage is so useless for the business we have at hand. Sighing, Hackle shrugged. The sigh had concession in it. The shrug was somehow mullish and unappeased. Two. Not many days after this conversation, Hackle and his death took an afternoon stroll by the river, along the slum shore's crumbling quays and rotting wharves. They talked with many lackadaisical pauses about mankind's love of life. An intractable paradox, the death said at length. People will, on the weakest pretext, waste vast amounts of time on aimless and valueless activity. They will do this to avoid fruitful and productive activities, even when these activities are not difficult. It is enough that they be work to make them shunned. And yet... No man or woman I have known would give away one week of his life, even if it purchased some rare thing. Hackle was greatly surprised. <coughs> Can this be true? The death gave a depreciatory wave of one gaunt hand, granting two conditions, that they are aware their deaths are somewhere close at hand and that they are not in any extreme bodily agony. Was these provisos? I can swear to you that I have met no one who would willingly trade a week for anything I could offer. But this is quite astonishing. Well, not that astonishing. Surely there is always a chance that one's fated time of death is less than a week away, and in that case, one loses both life's remnant and the reward he sold it for. Certainly, but you misunderstood me. What I found astonishing 
was primarily the fact that you made such offers in the first place. The death showed some discomfort. It stayed hackle, glanced left and right, and spoke in a lowered voice. You must understand, these little bargains are in the nature of a personal interest of mine. They're not, uh, sanctioned or even countenanced by my superiors. Quite the reverse, in fact. Hackle nodded sympathetically and kept his own voice low. I understand. What do you offer <coughs> in exchange for this week of <coughs> life? Anything within my powers to manage, the death said, with quiet emphasis. A tentative smile taunted the yellow skin of its lean jaw. The only reservation is that your wish involve, or aid, no evasion of your expiration date. And you do understand that this date is immutable, regardless if it supervene before or at any time during your enjoyment of your wish. <laughs> I do, indeed, and without wishing to insult you, I must ask you <laughs> if you mean this offer seriously, or I tell you frankly, I am most seriously minded to take you up on it. The death's smile grew wry. Forgive me if I'm skeptical in my turn. The offer is seriously made, to be sure. But, as I have pointed out, I have yet to meet the person who dared to take it up. <laughs> be comforted. You have just met him. Indeed? And what is your price for this week of your life? <laughs> An interview with Hofcraft, wherever in death he may lie. I must ask your purpose. To do myself justice, I intend to rebuke him. <laughs> who was more my father than my father was. I mean to accuse him to his face. <laughs> I, who loved and honored him to my ruin. If I have any life left after doing this, I will be able to live it <laughs> with peace of mind. Still faintly smiling, the death gazed at him a moment. You ask much, good hackle. I can implement it, but you must accomplish it. The map, the procedure, and gold I will give you. The going and the doing must all be yours, and it will be arduous. <laughs> give me the how of it, and give me gold. <laughs> Sweet gold. Gold will serve me for strength through the harshest territories. Give me <laughs> much gold, and then only my closing date. By coming too soon, can stop me. <laughs> but thus, of course, as it stood throughout my life. I 
had you but believed it, replied his death. After a pause, it added, Halfcraft's death was death by winter, a very great death. Death by winter's fastness is in the titan like basalts, in Bythogia Major. You must climb into the titan legs and solicit the aid of one of death's gatekeepers. I recommend Man of Blizzards, for he was Huffcraft's conveyor to death by winter. I will tell you how to invite his aid. But first, with your permission, I will take the week of your life. There is no point in wasting my breath on explanations if you're not going to survive the gamble. Is there? The death smiled, a faintly sadistic smile. <laughs> True enough, said Hackle, squaring his shoulders. All right, then. <laughs> Take it! Three. Had Hackle known how long his rebuke's preparations would take, he would have shunned the gamble from disbelief that sufficient life was left him. He had thought, with a week of his time, to purchase one daring, but relatively brief exploit, after which he was reconciled to a speedy embrace by his death. But simply to reach the threshold of that exploit took three months, and the mere standing upon that threshold was a feat of endurance. The snow-toothed winds chewed on his sunken cheeks, and each breath stabbed his sick lungs with air as thin and sharp as knives. As he rested briefly from his work, he did not even try to pry his aching fingers from the handles of his ice saw. He gazed down slope, where Squamp, the drayman he had hired, flogged his team uphill, was yet another sledful of dead wood, and marveled at his own continuing vitality. Perhaps... If death were not so strictly fated as most thought, it actually delayed his own by undertaking this rebuke, for a vengeful spirit seemed a tonic to both mind and body. A tonic had, in any case, been called for, since the invocationary arts required to summon men of blizzards were so toilsome he must be summoned here, near a mile above the timber line. He must be summoned with a fire blazing four times a man's height. And both the preparation and the lighting of the fire must be done strictly during times of snowfall. Nonetheless, the toil suited his mood, for as he cut and delayed each block of ice, in the curving wind wall, his mind was reviewing his past, trimming, dressing, and ordering the charges to be laid against his old preceptor. And, as Squamp brought up each load of wood, and Hackle laid the dead limbs on the fuel heap, his sculptor's eye saw in each one some cryptic, fragmentary gesture of remonstration and reproof all soon to combine in one blaze of accusation against Hofcraft. The load Squamp now dumped before him was, they had concurred, the last one needed. Hackle unclamped his hands from his eye saw, unpocketed and tendered the burly dry man a voucher for the withdrawal of funds from a bank in Bythogia's capital. The man accepted this somberly. 
I must say, Master Hackle, that I am still affronted by the distrust implied by this arrangement. But how can you be, Master Squamp? <coughs> I am old and ill, and already near my time. I've brought you far from the sight of men. If I'd carried cash, <laughs> who would not have been tempted? I would never have dreamed of committing a crime on the person of a lunatic like yourself, sir. It's bad luck to harm the daft. And if I may intrude my unwelcome opinion of the matter one last time, I still think you ought to leave the old man alone. I mean, this kind of vindictiveness is really outrageous, you know? <laughs> Thank you, good squamp, for sharing your views with me <laughs> yet again. <laughs> it saddens me that we must now part ways. The drayman smiled dourly. It gladdens me to leave this cold. This storm will surely hold. You should have snow enough to do your summoning. He climbed on his sled and whipped up his steam, then slanted leisurely away down slope. Hackle watched the dark shape zigzag disappearance into white silence. The air hit a snag in his lungs and he hugged himself to hold in a coughing fit. It racked him, convinced him for a moment that it would not end. He spat up the clot of infection it worked loose, reelingly inspecting it against the snow. Still only veined and freckled with red. Oh, splendid, he said, sneering to the mountain peaks to his fate at large. <laughs> For this day of execution, I humbly render thanks. Unsteadily, he marched back to the glacial knoll where he quarried his ice blocks and took up wedge and maul again. His pain had anesthetized an obscure pang, a cryptic qualm, that the sight of Squamp's departure had caused him. He settled to work, a sense of triumph dawning on him as he considered the nearness of his goal. The wind wall towered fifteen feet already. A block at a time, he laid the penultimate tear, his numb, boot-black feet slogged up and down his ladders of spliced boughs. Doning gauntlets he wrapped in chainmail coals from the flaming brazier already sheltered by the wall and mortared the row in place was melt, refrozen by the wind. In his rage to be done, he found himself pushing his lungs too hard, so by way of rest, he laid the last of the wood in its place on the huge crooked mountain of tented limbs. He returned to the wall, trying all the harder to slow his pace, because now a dread of what he was so near doing began in its turn to dawn on him. Perversely, the last tier of blocks seemed to leap from the quarry and spring to their place in the wall, while he himself swam easily through the work of it. Shortly, he found that his moment had come. The wind had risen, raking the wall with crystal claws. The sky, or rather, the enveloping white swarm, was graying. The light draining from it was what seemed a terrible haste. Hackle stared at the unkindled bonfire as if it wore the very essence of his accusation. That grievance he meant to carry to Hofcraft and his death. 
as if in perfect doubt of it, as if it were the fire to be of someone else's outrage, he kicked over the brazier, spilling its hot embers into the heap, gaping to learn if they would catch or not. The flames, like fugitive spies, spread with fitful stealth through the mazed limbs. The main assault followed. Increasingly fierce, it forked up in thickening legions, which, with a roar and a rush, were finally snatched by the gusts at the rim of the brazier and hoisted high into the blizzard above. Orange sabers, tusks, and tines, which even the blizzard, though it bent them, could not break. Hackle cringed against the wall from the heat. His eyes hunted the snow spume over the flame crests for a revelation. Abrupt as blinking, it appeared. The flame tips tickled the man of blizzard's boot soles, seemed to hold aloft his ogre's hugeness with these fiery licks of energy. His shaggy tunic and nude, but also shaggy arms and legs were sugared with snowflakes. His scalp, beard, and brows formed wholly of brambled ice, accented and parenthesized, a somber-eyed, big-jawed face that was both forbidding and fractionally amused. So, said men of blizzards, your wish, his voice, conversationally pitched, seemed to occur in a miraculously little zone of silence localized around Hackle's ears. Against the blizzard's howl, Hackle pitched his own voice at a shout. I wish to be... Please, was a pained expression the man of blizzards raised a palm. Do not bellow. <laughs> Forgive me. I wish to be taken to Hofkraf, former statutarius of Harap. Death by winter, your lord, has him in keeping. Hackle could feel his voice as a thrumming was in his ribs, but could hear no sound of it, which was utterly erased from his lips by the gale. This disoriented and obscurely frightened him. He had thought of this declaration as ringing out, a bold, resonant hammering against the door of Hofcraft's deathly retreat. I must ask your purpose, the man of blizzards answered. <laughs> it is to rebuke him. He was my sponsor. I wish to upbraid him was his failure of me, <laughs> and was his flaws in himself that made him fail. Hmm, I remember Hofcraft. He was part of a caravan of adventurers that I enrolled in a freak spring storm at the Ragged Pass in the Feast in Gnarlies. I remember my surprise at his age, the oldest in the party. The recruits for such foolish causes run young as a rule. Hackle nodded, smiling disgustedly. <laughs> a caravan of privateers, or so I heard, bound for honor and booty, in the holy wars, in the isles of the northern splash, was he not? <coughs> oh, man of blizzards! Just so, but a front, in fact, a ploy by one of the slave magnets of these mountains, unknowingly, Hofcraft was en route to a death in chains when I took him. 
<laughs> he was in his dotage then, believing his own lifelong affectation <laughs> of freedom and daring. <laughs> Are you going to take me to him? Yes. As if he stood on something solid, the man of blizzards leaped with a firm launch down to the glacier. Huge as a hill troll, he scarcely made the impact of an alley cat. Climb on my shoulders, he said, kneeling with his back to hackle. The sculptor, with a horripilation of either loathing or awe, mounted the giant and grasped his thorny neck. The man of blizzards sprang straight up into the storm. Four. Now the blizzard utterly sealed Hackle's eyes and ears. Blind, upsurgent, for an immeasurable time he was borne numbly aloft. Then he was on his legs again, his bear beside him. They stood on a snowy plain where, close enough, two miles away, to blot half the sky, a tremendous figure lay. The behemoth slept on his back. His frosty hair and beard were bound with the ice on that populous, gnolled, and gullied plain. Streams of icy melt leaked from his ears and nose and slack, snoring mouth, thawing grottoes from the wilderness of his hair. The sky was a skim-milk opacity without feature. The figures that thronged the plain grottoed most thickly in his hair, and choking the gullies like anemones, war, the unmoving dead. Hackle's guide indicated the behemoth. Death by winter, insofar as he does not notice, will not mind you stealing an interview with Havcraft. You follow me? Perfectly. To ensure he does not notice, look that you exchange nothing but views with Havcraft. Neither take nor give anything but words. Havcraft lies just past your knoll, in his own little hollow. When you have done, return here and make your own exit. The giant pointed at the ground, where a hole appeared. At its bottom, indeterminately deep, a smoky movement could be seen, and a distant whining heard, a storm noise that seemed minute beneath the vast rumbling sound ceiling of death by winter snoring. <laughs> Who? asked Hackle, knowing but afraid. Just jump into it. Oh, yes. Where would you issue from it? In the slums. <laughs> Cross river from Rop. Done. Goodbye. The man of blizzards leaped into the hole. His bulky shoulders shrank to a spot, a dot, to nothing, before he seemed to reach the storm below. Hackle turned toward the knoll his guide had pointed out. The dead he passed sat staring stupidly at the ground. Some slowly looked up to blink at him, and a few knit their brows with the remnants of perplexity, but all returned their gazes to the ground. And just so sat Huffcraft when Hackle, arms akimbo, stood before him relishing the sight. The old man's back was half propped up by an outcrop of ice. He stared dully at his legs, which were sprawled like a dropped marionette's and frozen to the ground. He wore the rayfish two-peaked hat known as a corsair's cap, its snow-powdered prongs jutting askew above his glassy-eyed face made him look 
less like an adventurer than a bumpkin got up for the fair. The spectacle's pitifulness filled Hackle with horror, hinting at the same droll futility his own life had become. <laughs> Huffcruff! Look up! Look here! Do you know me, old man? Slowly, the snow-blind milky eyes lifted to his. Huffcraft's lip hung doltishly, it mouthed vaguely, fish-like, bringing out no sound. So, mocked Hackle, you don't know me, but of course, I'm sure you never thought of me enough to have imagined how I would look as an old man. <laughs> I am Hackle, your journeyman! Hackle, your pupil of ten years! A faint palsy had begun to rock Hofcraft's head. His eyes seemed to thaw at the corners, where two attentive glints grew blacker. Now the sottish lips brought out sound, an all but voiceless gasp. Hackle. Fury flared in Hackle, a rage to melt this cosmic torpor, binding the man he had come at such risk to prosecute. Yes, he thundered. Hackle, whom you robbed of his true career. You, who should have prepared him <laughs> for accomplishment. Here, somehow, his voice displayed the awful power, seemed to roll booming for miles in all directions. The titan's huge snore actually faltered. This, and the tremor of one of Death by Winter's eyelids, made Hackle's body rubbery with horror. said the dead man wonderingly. His voice broke free on the word with a frosty crackle. With measured effort, he brought out more words. How are you so free? The old man's eyes moved up and down Hackle's body to indicate his standing his mobility. The giant's snoring had resumed. Still shaken, Hackle looked at Hofcraft with a somewhat chastened wrath. Free? He grunted. In all my life, I've been free only in this last act of coming here alive to confront you. As for the rest... And all my work, I have never been free from the triviality and futility you bequeathed me. Halfcraft's head, still faintly palsied, showed a catch in his wobble, as though a suspicion had just wakened in him. His eyes looked fully thawed, but his voice hadn't quite reached that state. You still live and come to death to confront me? And to rebuke you? Oh, to think how I looked up to you, you slight, slippery man! To think how I, yes, loved you! You have come here to rebuke me? The icy gasp of outrage, the old man gave the word, inflamed Hackle anew. He almost howled again, caught himself, then leaned close to his old teacher, his teeth clenched. You mountback, you jack of all styles! On call to any mass producer who needed his cliches trimmed and polished, 
yet who praised and detailed greatness in your swaggering extemporizations. You ducked every artistic challenge, every serious devotion to an idea. What else could I have become but an adept and addict of that same hollow facility? Curse you, Hackle, you mealy-mouthed whiner! Halfcraft's voice was now fully his own, with that light, sandpapery, chafing quality, like Bumis buffing marble that had always made the man's diatribes so bright and savory to Hackle's ear. The sound, unheard for twenty-five years, sparked a senseless, automatic warmth in his heart. Your arrogance astounds me, Halfcraft was saying. Am I to have no surcease of fools and their follies? Not even here? Am I a fool? choked Hackle. His old master's voice had mixed grief with his rage. He ground his teeth. If I am, who made me so? Who trained me? I did not lack native talent when I came under your care. Care? Ha! If I am a fool, what were you? You there in your corsair's cap, posturing dwarf, swashbuckling beetle. Of course, but my follies were my own, and I didn't go whining to anyone else with the charge of them. Did your needs not crowd my career enough that you should crowd me even here and now with your complaints? Indignation had so limbered the old man's icy innards that even his derelict limbs began to wake. To tremor was the ardor that had melted his lungs and warmed his words to all their ancient resonance. Now, at last, Hackle felt the triumph of accomplishment. His spirit soared above the pallid, death-encumbered plain. He was touching near the heart of his rebuke, and having it felt. Crowd your career! What care did you ever take to show me more than you were expert in? To strut your special tricks, spread your peacock's tail of paltry plumage to an ignorant and worshipful eye. This you would do readily enough, and at little labor. What? My limitations? Have you come to scold me for these? Blame your own upon them? You're in your dotage, surely, Hackle. Look at this trek you've made to me. It can't have been other than grueling and full of risk. Couldn't you have spent all this tenacity and daring on curing your own limits instead of on carrying blame to a dead man's door? Ah, <gasps> but no one knows one's weakness till it has toppled him, till he has fallen short of what he aimed at. He was half smiling and almost shouting again careless of the titan, in the near ecstasy of speaking the truth, delimiting his life. By the time I knew whether I must move, my soul had stiffened, my eye and ear for inspiration had grown dull. By the time I knew what to look and listen for. So, the sum of your folly is that I was to have taught you what I had not mastered. Yes! A truth your sarcasm cannot avert. For you had talent. You knew at least the shape of what you had not achieved. The frontiers of the territory you had not dared to penetrate. If you had cared for my life, you could have taken just one step outside your vanity. You could have sketched for me those realms you had to know existed beyond the realms of your small-scale expertise and easy superiorities. In such spirit of love, you could have let me know there are degrees of dedication in art that purchase something lasting, something rare that repays all effort 
recompenses everything death takes from us. His rebuke, Hackle felt in this moment, was delivered. And yet, amazingly, it felt not so much like the transmission of an idea as the shedding of an entire state of mind. Everything he saw abruptly seemed different, those white miles of tumbled lives around him. All those wrecks in death's freeze now filled him with a giant tenderness. Death by winter, blotting half the sky, shimmered, faintly imbued by auroral lightnings. The rumble of his slumbering breath now purred with a majesty almost musical, like the trumpets and drum rolls of a mighty army mustering. But foremost of these transformations was Halfcraft's. The cadaver blinked, stared a moment, and was shaken by a laugh. This laugh, albeit a single bark and soft, was like a final thawing of the old man's body. For the first time, he moved his hands, stiffly presenting them, palms up, to his own wry gaze. Nothing, my dear Hackle, recompenses everything death takes from us. Recompenses anything death takes from us. He lifted his look to Hackle. Weasley, his former student, had always thought that look. For instance, when Hofcraft was peering at a block and ferreting out with his eyes the shape latent in the stone. As for loving you, I did, the corpse continued. But was the same lazy and imperfect sort of love I showed myself. For had I been capable of the pure and strictly honest kind you rant about, I might have shown it to myself and been the artist you so rightly say I wasn't. And the same goes for you, of course, doesn't it? Of course, smiled Hackle. The easy concession was like shedding weight, ejecting a ball cast of ancient grievances. Indeed, he felt ever more levitational. His sickish lungs felt inflated, engorged with healing arctic air of unimagined freedom. How curlish I have been! Huffcraft! He almost crawled. What a curlishness has possessed me in these last few years of my life! He flung his words jubilantly abroad, his echoes big and distant, dispersed over the plain. Half calmingly, half Kraft's hand came up. Yes, well, an angry and accusing state of mind is a kind of balm to a hungry spirit, I suppose, he offered. He seemed faintly uneasy at his former student's fire and cast a glance toward death by winter. But Hackle was highly volatile now in his heart's emancipation. He was all fire and air, it seemed, and could not be bothered to tone down his dithyram. Ah, oh, dear old Huffcraft, bless your patience with my fractious taunts. Well, here, of course, calm and patience are. Just think, whatever your faults, how unlucky I might have been with a different sponsor. I could have got some square-nosed somber sides who would have felt duty-bound to pinch and sour and buckle down my imagination. You know, it's simply not enough just to thank you. No, for a decade of instruction, which, whatever its deficiencies, was always patient, friendly, and inventive in its explanatory methods. Not enough by half. Oh, no! 
Hackle had begun to pace a fervent little circuit before his recumbent and now visibly uneasy former sponsor. Pacing, rubbing his hands together, he spoke in a tone of dawning revelation. Or haven't you carried me, metaphorically speaking, through my student decade, a major passage of my life? Then I should do no less for you and carry you literally back to life. Oh yes, a major passage that, wouldn't you agree, my dear old teacher? The corpse, impossibly, blenched. Blatant fear now caused his legs to palsy with his head, and his shaking blue hands were raised in prevention. Madness, Hackle! You're proposing madness! It is not done! Hackle now stood suddenly still and smiled. Purpose surged through him. Old teacher, he trumpeted. Old friend, when an enormity is to be done, it must be done at once to outrun second thoughts. He bent and clamped the dead man's ribs between both palms. He hoisted too hard and almost fell, for Halfcraft was bulky light, like the skeleton of a big bird. Hackle draped his teacher down his back, clamping the fragile forearms against his chest. He sat out striding for the portal he had entered by. It is not done, Hackle! It is not done! Though Halfcraft's lips were at his ear, his voice sounded eerily distant and feeble. His passenger struggled as he spoke, but his protests, too, were strangely weak. His twitches might have been the wind, steering Hackle's pithless, unseen burden. For indeed, a stiff wind had suddenly sprung up and kicked to life ahead of him, shifty, shrill wind devils of powdered snow. He had scarcely put behind him his teacher's resting place when the vastly overlooming snore of death by winter came with a grinding boom to a pause. Hackle broke into a jog trot. The wind the devils quickened and swelled, came hornets swarming against him, expunging his ability. Slothfully, the colossus shifted where it lay, and the ice plane under Hackle's feet groaned and faintly tauntened. The torque was slight, but dreadful in its scale, and Hackle now began to run outright, shouldering frantically forward through the stinging whiteouts, steering by glimpses of the portal pit. From this, a smarmy vortex now towered, as if either this air were draining down it, or the lower air were cycling out of it. Again, the titan stirred, and awful stresses tensed to the icy world floor. Eyes mad, a war cry on his lips that he himself was deaf to in those gales. Hackle broke into a reckless sprint. His lungs, in his delirium, were restored him, and his feet, unhesitant and firm, found their way on that blind and broken ground. His teacher felt ever lighter, like a banner that he towed, a trophy waving before him like a flame. A shift in the devil winds, showed him the spuming pit was near. A terrible and ambiguous thing to leap into, were it not for the huger thing, visible beyond it. This was the slow opening of one of Death by Winter's mammoth, necreous eyes. The immense cataracted orb rolled, to aim down upon the thieving sculptor. 
a tidal front of fear swept down against Hackle then. With fierce and slackening drive, Mad Hackle hit the portal pit at a dead run and dove into that howling eyeless throat of storm as to some refuge from the meaning in the giant's eye. There was a fall through miles of storm, a strange, void fall that didn't hasten past a certain speed. The storm opened out, its winds made wilder music, and the air tasted richer. Hackle hit a snowbank, solidly, but the drift was deep and soft. He floundered instantly to his feet, for he had felt at impact an absence at his back, though his hand still pressed his teachers to his chest. Indeed, Afgraf was gone. His pithless forearm had snapped bloodlessly in half. It made Hackle smile after a moment to reflect that all he'd brought back of his old sponsor was his right hand. He stepped out of the snowdrift, which was a big, bright anomaly in the arid hills behind the slums. Across the river, Harab sparkled beneath the jut's towering, inarticulate mass. Home again, he told himself. He looked anew at his knuckly memento of Hofcrafts. The fingers were frozen in a partial closure, which struck Hackle the longer he looked at it as remarkably, mysteriously eloquent. He laid it on the ground to look at it from various vantages, when, after a time, it turned suddenly to ice, then molded snow, and then was gone. Hackle found he had memorized its gesture. Five. Hackle went home and slept till the following noon. He rose with a determined expression, which looked grim and peaceful in equal parts. He had some breakfast and then strolled out to his front steps, where he expected to find his death sitting, and did. He sat down beside it. Welcome home, the death said. Accept my congratulations. You're a rare and worthy man, I assure you, Hackle. I am most impressed with your tenacity and your daring. Thank you. May I impress you further? The death's affability just perceptibly froze. This passion now qualified its smile. You suggest... A further indiscretion on my part? I do, yes. Hmm, I don't reject this out of hand. Of course, I shall be harder to impress, if you see what I mean. One month of my life is what I'd pay. A month? The death's voice echoed was a tone of lugubrious awe. Its pit-black gaze dwelled wonderingly on Hackle, showing him the vacuum that his gamble risked. A maggot, as if called forth by its host's amazement, shyly poked its snout from its burrow in the cheesy orbit of death's left eye. The death plucked, bowled, and flicked it, then replied, I am impressed anew. What service would you require? The help of death by lightning for one night. We can do business. After a delicate pause, it added, You wish to yield the month up now? I do. I don't mind telling you, by way of warning, you're playing this one 
very close. Thank you, but proceed. That evening, a storm gathered over Harab. It fell so furiously and long. The citizens cowered awake all night beneath their beds. It seemed to center on the jut, where incessant lightnings played, vast, brief blades of fire that whittled and bit and hewed a steady hail of rubble from the crack. Gravel chittered and rattled on the city's roofs like a second rainfall. At sunrise, the jut stood utterly remade before the timid eyes of the town folk, blinking out at the sudden calm. Its form was that of a raised hand, a thousand feet high. Its gesture was ambiguous, and this ambiguity was to father sects in Harab in generations to come. Some held that the hand was poised to grasp the city, others that the hand proclaimed a benediction on it. Only Hackle, who survived by almost a day the carving of it, and spent the time admiring it till he died, he alone knew the identity of that gesture, that of a sculptor's hand that is pausing to weigh a concluding stroke upon some labor of love.